Hi, I'm Linda Ware, and the talk today is called Evidence for Everyday Health Choices. I'm going to be speaking about evidence-based medicine and also about the work of the Cochrane Collaboration. My background is in general practice. I was a part-time partner in rural Oxfordshire for over 31 years. I'm now Senior Fellow in General Practice with Cochrane UK. Let's start by defining what is meant by evidence-based medicine, or EBM for short. EBM is the process of systematically reviewing, appraising and using clinical research findings to aid the delivery of optimum clinical care to patients. In other words, it's the process whereby all available clinical research data on any defined topic are collected, assessed and published as systematic reviews. The findings of these reviews help inform us, the patients, along with our clinicians and policy makers, as to the best evidence for treatment. I'm now going to go at lightning speed through a brief history of medical research to give you some context to the development of EBM. The world's first recorded clinical trial is documented in the Bible, in the Book of Daniel, and dates from 500 BC, more than a century before Hippocrates. King Nebuchadnezzar had decreed that his people should eat only meat and drink only wine in order to maintain peak physical fitness. He was challenged by some of his noblemen who were vegetarians and so he decided to carry out what we'd now regard as a simple clinical trial. He organised one group to consume only vegetables and water, whilst the other group followed his preferred diet. The results surprised him. The vegetarians emerged as the better nourished group, and he therefore acquiesced to their demands to choose their own food. This magnificent gentleman is Avicenna, a Persian scholar and physician of the 11th century, famed, among many other things, for writing a 14-volume medical textbook called The Canon of Medicine, which was still in use in Europe and the Islamic world in the 17th century. He undertook trials of drug treatments, and some of his research principles are still relevant today. For example, he concluded that when assessing the action of a drug, the drug must be free from any extraneous accidental quality. The time of action must be observed so that essence and accident are not confused. The effect of the drug must be seen to occur constantly or in many cases, for if this did not happen, it was accidental effect. And finally, this is an important concept today, but perhaps not in the choice of the animal model. The experiment must be made with the human body, for testing a drug on a lion or a horse might not prove anything about its effect on a man. We now move swiftly on to the 18th century and to James Lind. He was an Edinburgh ship surgeon who identified the cause of scurvy in sailors on long sea voyages. In 1747, he conducted a small clinical trial with 12 sailors, all of whom were suffering from scurvy. He divided them into pairs and treated each pair with a different possible remedy. He gave one pair sulfuric acid. This was the recommended treatment by the then Royal College of Physicians. Another pair received vinegar. This was the Admiralty's favoured treatment. Another pair received seawater, another pair nutmeg, another pair cider, and the final pair was given two oranges and a lemon every day. As we all know, the eureka moment came with the citrus fruit. Sadly, it took 50 years before the British Navy made lemon juice a mandatory part of the sailor's diet. In 2003, some 250 years after the publication of Lynn's Treatise on the Scurvy, the James Lynn Library was set up to illustrate the evolution of fair tests of treatment in healthcare. In 2004, the James Lind Alliance was created to bring together patients, carers and clinicians to identify and prioritise unanswered questions about designated treatments. Now we meet Archie Cochrane, who hailed James Lind as his medical hero. He can be credited with having the vision 
of what would become evidence-based medicine. He was a Scottish physician who studied at Cambridge and University College Hospital London. During the Second World War, he served in the British Army and was captured. Whilst being held in Salonika, he effectively became the medical officer to thousands of British prisoners of war interned in the camp. Rather like Lind before him, he managed to identify the unknown cause of a debilitating condition affecting many of the soldiers and Cochrane himself. The condition caused fluid retention in the legs. In a simple clinical trial, he took 40 severely affected men and divided them into two groups, housed in separate huts. In addition to their basic frugal diet, he gave one group vitamin C and the other black market marmite, a rich source of B vitamins. It soon became apparent that marmite brought about a cure of the condition. By sheer force of personality, and speaking German with a pronounced Scottish accent, he managed to persuade the German commanders to supply the prisoners with a more wholesome diet. He described this piece of research as his first, worst and most successful clinical trial. After the war, he spoke and wrote critically of the medical practices he observed that were based on little or no medical evidence. He coined the phrase, the God complex, which he saw in the attitudes of many of his medical colleagues. He was a staunch advocate of the use of randomised controlled trials, RCTs, which are still considered to be the gold standard of research. And, as you can read on the slide, he felt that it was surely a great criticism of medicine that we have not organised a critical summary by specialty or subspecialty of all randomised controlled trials. In other words, he proposed what we now accept as evidence-based medicine. With this history and these credentials, it's not surprising that Archie Cochrane's name was used by Ian Chalmers and his colleagues when the Oxford Cochrane Centre was created in 1992. A year later, the International Cochrane Collaboration was established and it remains the world's largest organisation committed to producing systematic reviews of medical evidence, which facilitate and inform medical decision-making. Cochrane reviews are systematic reviews of primary research in health care and health policy. They are internationally recognised as the highest standard of EBM. The reviews are published online in the Cochrane database of systematic reviews in the Cochrane Library. So, how is a systematic review done? The first step is to formulate the question that needs to be answered. This isn't always as simple as it might sound. An example might be, can antibiotics help in alleviating the symptoms of a sore throat? Another example might be, is exercise beneficial for people with osteoarthritis in their knees? The next step is to search for all the existing primary research on the chosen topic, ensuring that it adheres to predetermined criteria. The data from the research trials are collated and then assessed using stringent, standardised guidelines to establish whether or not there is conclusive evidence. Cochrane systematic reviews are then published and regularly updated to include new evidence, thereby ensuring that they are always as up-to-date as possible. Let me now give you a few examples of how EBM affects us in our daily lives. You might have been wondering about what the Cochrane logo means. You'll first notice the two mirror image C's that represent the global Cochrane collaboration. Within them is a forest plot depicting the results of an iconic systematic review, which looked at trials assessing the effectiveness of giving corticosteroids to women in premature labour. In the forest plot, the vertical line represents no difference between the effect of corticosteroid and placebo. To the left of this vertical line, steroid is more effective, and to the right, placebo is favoured. The horizontal lines each represent a clinical trial, 
and the diamond at the bottom is the overall relative risk when the trials are combined. In the first trial, in 1972, benefits were shown in the survival rates of preterm babies. But it was not until the results of seven trials were combined in a systematic review in 1991 that the life-saving implications of this intervention were fully appreciated. Giving corticosteroids to women who are about to give birth prematurely can save the life of the newborn child. Thousands of babies have been saved by this simple intervention. Let's take a look at some more recent Cochrane systematic reviews. This also gives me the opportunity to demonstrate some other ways in which information from the systematic reviews can be accessed. This is a blog shot from the Evidently Cochrane website of a systematic review published in 2015. It shows that people consistently consume more food and non-alcoholic drink when offered larger size portions, packages and tableware. This might seem like stating the blindingly obvious, but in order to inform and change policy, hard evidence is needed. Here is a blog, also from Evidently Cochrane, describing a systematic review published in 2015 looking at the effectiveness of over-the-counter painkillers. Finally, from the Cochrane Library website, an example of a systematic review available in full text and in abstract, with a plain language summary for non-medical readers. This review provides the most robust evidence yet that the smoking ban reduces the harms of passive smoking. In particular, it reduces the risk of heart disease. All Cochrane systematic reviews are available to be read on the Cochrane Library website. Let's now turn our attention to the media and to two eye-catching headlines from the newspapers, one from a tabloid and one from a broadsheet publication. To kick off, here's a piece of health advice, courtesy of the Mirror. Two chocolate bars a day can slash, note the hyperbole, the risk of heart disease and stroke. Oh, that this were true. The headline refers to an observational cohort study started in the 1990s, looking at diet and its association with the development of heart disease and stroke. It appears on first glance to indicate that the more chocolate people eat, the smaller their risk of suffering from heart disease, stroke and death. But all is not as the headline might lead us to believe. Why should we be cautious about taking this at face value? Well, firstly, it reports on an observational study. Observed data can show a possible association, but do not prove causation. Secondly, some of the benefits of chocolate might be linked to the person consuming it being generally healthier overall. It was evident from the study that some higher chocolate consumers were more physically active. Another factor to consider is that the data relied on self-reporting of food intake. Maybe not always the most accurate source of data collection. Dare I cite memory and perhaps rather less than absolute honesty. There might also be an element of reverse causation, by which I mean that those people who consider themselves to be at risk of heart disease and stroke might well be those who eat more carefully avoiding foods such as chocolate. We also need to consider the fat and sugar content of chocolate and their link to obesity, a potent risk factor for cardiovascular disease. So, a cautionary tale which should make us alert to the need to always look behind the headlines. Behind the headlines is the name given to an informative website set up by Muir Gray to do just what its name suggests. More details of this at the end of the presentation. Here is a headline from the Telegraph newspaper with an accompanying photo of some very scary looking cats. The headline implies that women who have pet cats are more likely to commit suicide. What it refers to, in fact, is a Danish study looking at toxoplasmosis in new mothers and an apparent link to an increased risk of self-harm. 
Toxoplasmosis is an infection that can be caught from cats. As with the chocolate bars headline we just looked at, this was an observational study showing an association but not necessarily a causal link. Many other explanations may underlie the apparent finding. The headline really is just plain wrong. Evidence-based medicine can help us make our own personal health decisions. There are many trustworthy EBM supported websites that can give us reliable information on health issues. We live in a time of information overload and it's important that we can find accurate, independent sources of health advice to help us reach the right decisions. At the end of this presentation, I will list some websites which you might find useful. I hope this short introduction to evidence-based medicine has given you a taste of what it's all about and how it can help all of us make good choices to improve our health. EBM gives us trusted evidence to aid informed decisions leading to better health. Thank you.